morning and thank you for having me at today's management meeting. There are a lot of familiar faces across the room, but for those of you who have not met me, my name is Renee Higman and I'm a recent Human Resource Management graduate from James Cook University. As you will see on the agenda, I'm here to discuss with you change management, the nature of change and the critical issues involved in change. This is a topic I'm very interested about and over the next 10 minutes I look forward to talking with you about some of the theories of change and hopefully give you some ways in which you can lead change next time more successfully. So firstly I want to look at the theory of change. For a long time it was led to be believed that change occurred in a cumulative incremental way. So we went about business and thought, hmm, let's change something to be a little bit better. And so we did that and we went up and then that needed some changing. So we changed again and we continued to go up. But this theory was challenged and now it's led to believe that change occurs in a punctuated equilibrium form. This means that for a long period of time, the business is stable and then due to whatever reason, it'll undergo rapid change and then back into states of stability. So now let's think about the ways or the parts in your organisation which may be affected by the change. You could have strategic change that takes place within your organisation and that would be a change in your mission, a change in your objectives and reassessing where you're, you fit within the market of your industry. And then there's structural change. And this would be a change in your hierarchy. You know, for, for this accounting firm, it might mean that one of the partners leaves and you have a new partner that buys in. And this brings a lot of change. New clients, some clients you may lose. And then there is also mergers that occur in businesses. And with that comes job duplications, perhaps you have someone from one company that merges that doesn't quite fit the new plan or doesn't quite have the skills of the new, that you need them to have to fit into the new structure. And then of course the change we all know about and probably the most difficult to deal with, the people change. This is hard because you are having to change the behaviours of your staff, try and motivate them, you know, look at things differently within their role. And then we have things such as planned change versus unplanned change. And I mean, in an ideal world, we would love that all of our change is planned. It gives us time to implement the process to ensure that it works successfully. But as we know, it doesn't always work like this. And there may be an event out of our control that means you've had to develop a change process with no planning. And then there's transformational change versus incremental change. Is the whole organisation having to change at once or is there just a certain part of the business that isn't performing that requires you to change what they're doing and before, rather than having to change the whole organisation? Or it might be that there's a number of parts of the business that need change but you're going to do them one at a time so you get something in place before you move on to the next part of your business. And then there's developmental versus remedial change. Are you changing because of an event, you, like sales are down so you need to change because of this? Or are you simply trying to better the organisation and you're doing developmental change? So as you can see, there is a large ways in which change affects organisation. And there is a number of processes out there, but one that's referred to quite often is Kurt Lewin's three-step model. He talks about you need to, to change, you need to, one, be motivated to change, but you need to unfreeze what's currently happening. So before you can move, you need to go, know that you're not happy where you are, want to change and change the current processes. And then the middle step is the actual changing, what needs to be changed. And within this, although it seems simple here in one step, is a change process, so you need to make decisions, communicate, respond to what's happening, and go from your current state through to your future state. And once this process takes place, it's about refreezing the change and making it permanent, and then reviewing this new change and make sure you can sustain the new change. I now want to 
share with you a quote from Norm Brodsky, who said, either you're an agent of change or you're a victim of change. You simply cannot survive in the long term if you stand still. So if we all know that change is inevitable, which it is, then why is it so hard? And why are there so many times where a change process is unsuccessful? So now I want to discuss with you the key steps of change. It doesn't matter whether it's strategic change, structural change, people change, planned or unplanned. There's some key steps that will help you when you next have to lead change and hopefully your change process will be successful. So firstly, there's recognising the need for change. And this is about you know, sometimes scanning what's happening around you and recognising that there's a need for change. Sometimes if we just continue to go business as usual, in, you know, head down, we're not always recognising that there is a need to change within the organisation. And then diagnosis. So we need to diagnose what we need to change and we need to know what we're wanting at the end of this change. It's not possible to have a change process that's successful if you're not clear on where you're hoping to go at the end of that. So for you to be able to communicate and get your staff to buy in, you need to be clear of what you're trying to achieve with the change. And then planning, the planning stage. So we need to always ensure that we're a plan, plan to, I guess, if the, if the process is going off track, you need to be able to intervene. And planning has this. Like change is not, the processes are not always just straight line. Sometimes you'll diagnose a change and you'll put something in place and then that process isn't working. So then you have to diagnose again and then look at changing it again. And then implementing and reviewing. So once, but as I said, we can implement the plan, but we have to review the progress. And this, some, this is where leaders sometimes struggle because they can get caught up in the doing and they may even have invested interest in the change. The change may be going to alter your position or your role. And sometimes it's easy to just be you know, in the doing and not stepping back and observing what's happening with your staff, you know, having a look at the behaviours and seeing whether, you know, the change is being adopted because you may have to intervene and think this is getting off track, we're not achieving what we want to be achieving by the certain time frames and have to intervene. And then we have to sustain the change. So as Kurt Lewin said, you need to make sure that the new change remains in place. So you have to just, it's not just a matter of we got here, let's leave it. It's still about, you know, taking on the feedback of staff. Is this new process working? And being open to that. Step six, leading and managing the people issues. You know, as human resource professionals and as senior management, we know that leading and managing the people issues are probably the most difficult process of change and probably where a lot of change processes fail. So as you can see in this model, that throughout each stage of the model, there is still leading and managing people issues and learning. So it occurs throughout the whole process. So whilst recognising the process, you need to be aware of the people. You know, by diagnosing, you have to be aware of the people. So what are some of the things that we can do as leaders to ensure we manage the people issues? So within change, you want to consult your staff. You want to communicate with them regularly. Like, it's always going to be scary for people who are being involved as part of a change. And that's where as leaders of the business, you have to communicate to your team constantly. From the start, you need to communicate to them why this change is taking place. You need to sell the benefits of the change and talk about we're doing this because of this reason and this is where we want to, want to get with this. 
And you know, we all know there's going to be resistance to change. So what we need to do is identify key staff within our team that can be the driver or the change leader that you know that can engage with their other staff and get them on board. Give your staff tasks, give them ownership of the change. Like it's always going to be better if they're driving the change, they're going to be more likely to adapt and accept the change. And then there's step seven, le the learning. So we always have to like, no matter whether it's the change has worked well, we need to continue to learn from each change process. If I think about this discussion for the last 10 minutes, this, the key points I would say is that don't forget the people. They're always going to be, you know, sometimes the most difficult part of the change, but without having the people on board, the change is going to, you know, be very difficult. Consult, communicate, that's some other key things. And make sure you're leading by example. Like if there's a culture that you want, you need to lead it. You need to be the example of how you want. And make sure you know you're ready for change and you're always gonna, you know, like you're observing what's going on with competitors and making sure that at any time you need to put a change in place, that you're ready for change. Thank you for having me at the management meeting. I hope that some of the information and the topics that I covered will assist you next time you need to lead change within your departments.